I thought uh, we have, it's already, we had a lot of uh, strenuous stuff, so we are heading for something more relaxing, more narrative. I thought I, I do now the concepts of the background images and later on the guided imagery, where you can experiment yourself with background images and then exchange on that and we can discuss it. Does that sound right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, uh, before we come to the background images, I fill in the communication model, the encounter model of communication, what we had in the communication model. And this was a picture for it. It's going back to Jungian psychology, Ericksonian psychology, all the psychologists who work with the notion that there is an intuitive life with, uh, which has levels we even do not really know. And there is a conscious life that we can deal with quite uh, technically or methodically. And in Jungian psychology, uh, Jungian psychology believes that most of the personality is unconscious mind. And there is a small range of personalities that is conscious mind. Maybe it, it's true or not. Uh, I, I did it somehow 50-50. Uh, and these are two people on the left and on the right. As a simple case, when they meet each other, uh, they have a conscious idea what they do with each other, and uh, if it's professional, for example, they have a methodical equipment that's part of their role competence and con context competence to set up this encounter. And we will do maybe intuition later this afternoon or tomorrow morning. But intuitively, uh, as Bern said, within, this, within seconds, we have some kind... It, the other person is eliciting some kind of fantasy about who the other person is, from where she comes, and what kind of mythology is possible uh, to reach with this person. And we act on these impressions without knowing that we have these impressions and without understanding fully uh, that we are already in a common shared mythology. If it's a negative mythology, it's called games and interacting scripts. But the general view on that is that people, besides what they know from, uh, uh, from each other during meeting, consciously is only one part and there are a lot of informations about the other person about me reacting to the other person because we do not we, we cannot diagnose the other person we only can diagnose our own reaction to the other person the images that came up in, in ourselves so in order to know what it is diagnosing about the other person I need to be in good dialogue with myself so the dialogue between the conscious methodical level and the unconscious intuitive level is important within each person. And uh, if you want to include these dimensions, for example, in the communication culture in a, in a group or in the organization, it's important to introduce <coughs> ways to do uh, to to invite this dialogue between conscious methodical levels and unconscious intuitive level uh, in an accepted frame and also into a professional frame of reference. Usually if there is this assessment, there are a lot of conscious criteria, but many of these processes, when you look at them, they are only a service that give people a chance intuitively come to a judgment of of some kind. And this judgment might be good or bad, but it's out of out of the discussion, mm -hmm. so it cannot be corrected. And I think a good organizational culture mm -hmm. is one where we can work with the images that come up, that tell us what we are in what our intuitions are, and that we can compare intuitions and really discuss it. 
So, a good professional communication uh, is heading for building up a safe framework methodically and consciously that leaves a lot of space for unconscious intuitive forces not only working on the background but being uh, playing also on the foreground and to talk uh, uh, about this have some kind of an exchange and be and share the inner dialogue in these exchanges we do that in our training groups we do that a lot we have uh, with all professionals every three day we have one hour on dialoguing on intuitions on each other and focused dialogues for example when we have the seminar on power. Then we uh, we have the mirroring. We call that mirroring. It's not feedback in the sense of I watched you and I can tell you what you did. And so just when I I'm encountering you and I have a dialogue with what happened within me, these are the images that come up, and I share these with you. I don't know whether they are, are valid or not, but they are real, and and. If they are coming up in me, they might also come up in others and they decide on these images without knowing that they decide on that. And it's better you know what kind of images you elicit when you meet people. To know that is an important part of professional competence. And but this is not just a, a question of natural intuition or so, it's very focused. For example, in our master's trainings we do exercises. Oh no, first there's a, a power exercise, and so we have a question like, uh, if you have all power over the... Uh, if you are on an island with, with the other one, and the other one has all resources, and you are totally dependent on him or her, if you image, image, image uh, have an imagination about this, what, what reactions come up? What does this create in your inner world? And if you would believe all that what is created, how would that shape your encounter and your reaction with the other person? Or if, if the other person is my text controller? It, or or questions, uh, you you give power to somebody when? What convinces you that it's okay to give to somebody power? And it's the authorization. And it's very different from person to person. And it's different for, from organization to organization or, to, or from profession to profession. And so we have a lot of exchange between each other. Um, so that everybody is brought into this dialogue within his own personality and this helps to make good social diagnosis and at the same time uh, that there is exchange how they fit together or do not fit together so it's a, a, a training culture on dealing with intuitive judgments and whenever we do uh, with people who are totally untrained on that, we do guided imagery and then an exchange, the communication atmosphere changes. It's, it's getting transcendent. People, most people are interested being aware of what is happening uh, on the level of intuitive judging within them. But many people think it's not part of professional communication culture. And so we do a lot because we are highly accepted as a professional organization. And when it's done in our group, then it's part of the profession. And so it's helped to build up norms, uh, values, on including intuition. <coughs> um, I don't know now, right now, why, why I have connected this with life plans. 
but maybe it was for the J people because they want to know what is Bernd Schmidt thinking about script. <laughs> uh, I will see later more. I, I think everybody is. I said it already. Is uh, people are narrative beings. They want uh, one of the most important wishes people have to make a good story out of their life. And we somehow tend to develop specific stories, but we are on the way. We don't know so good what what is our nature, what is our what are the stories that will really fit to us and what not. And I mean the positive stories. I do not mean the negative versions called scripts. And so the question is. Uh, What are the influences on life plans? And it's not only early decisions. It's nature of an individual. The one person is very ambitious by nature somehow. And the other person isn't. It causes different logics for developing a life plan. It's not pathological in the one or the other way. It's just different. <coughs> And if, body, if somebody is Uh, uh, very dominating from nature, the person must somehow develop a lifestyle and a life plan that is positively integrating domination. It's not a solution uh, to go on the other side and only fighting all these other dominating people. So it's nature, it's talents and ambitions. And I hope people are ambitious. So I, I support people to be ambitious. It's equipments and requests from families, and there come in tradition and uh, transference problems, life scripts, injunction, and all that. It's attitudes to life and lifestyles of the milieu. It's a person is not only a person; he is part of a milieu. I said when two people marry, they, today they think individuals marry, but that's not true. They will notice <laughs> they marry a milieu, a former milieu, an actual milieu. If you married a, a manager in a high tech organization, you don't marry a private person. You marry a person who is connected to a milieu, and you have, if you have to want to live together, you have to find a way to deal with that. Even if this person would be different in a different milieu, as long as this person is in this milieu, it's part of your relationship. Mm -hmm. And. I was thinking arranged marriages in India are very aware of that. Yeah. It's part of the arrangement. Yeah, they, they, they are not conscious. so much on the individual, individualism trip as we are. So we have to, to go back a bit. <laughs> we have many illusions. So, uh, and I, I, I always say, uh, if you want to understand who you are, you need at least three generations. Marcelvini Palazzoli said it takes three generations to produce a schizophrenic. Mm. I say it takes three generations to produce any character. And Byrne mm. said the grandparents were the most important. Yeah. Oh, he says that too. Mm. I was, wasn't aware of that. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, and there are many formative experiences, I've called them. Uh, On the way, at the end, you do not wo you do not know what what have been your genes and what have been early influences uh, from beginning on the, the chemical climate, when your fetus uh, build up specific conditions in your brain in your hormone system. Uh, it's not possible to decide the question whether it's nature or education. The brain research this doesn't give any hints that we can ever decide this. So there are many formative experiences, and we do not know which those are. 
and what we made out of it. But we would like to know to understand what is our character and what kind of life uh, development could be ours. And this is where the inner images come in. It's a way to diagnose. But let me uh, first go to Fanita English. She very early was uh, be, uh, involved in the question of creative scripts. And she, I guess it was in the 70s, already invented an exercise, what we uh, revitalized. Uh, she, she was very strict in the format of the uh, exercise. We are not so strict with the format. But she said, let, let a person tell a story from childhood and write it down in four lines or six lines. The format should be comparable. And then from adolescence and then from presence, maybe she had a fourth part. Maybe um, it's um, uh, pubertate. Two in childhood, early childhood mm -hmm. and somewhere around and school? eight, nine, ten. Yes, uh, eight. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. And, uh, and, and so then you read loud your stories, stories you have adopted, you associate with this time in life, not, not personal history not biography, stories you have adopted that reflect somehow uh, this age in your history. And then you read it loud to others and say find patterns in that story, say find stages in the, uh, taken in the theater metaphor, say find roles, say find kind of stories, say find styles. And when they compare the stories, they give you feedback about their understanding of developing through these stories. So you get, you, you get an idea how you are developing your life plan and change it uh, in different stages of your life for better or worse or getting more differentiated or giving up or whatever. So it's a metaphorical way of mirroring on life plans. And she also uh, did not compulsively connect this with uh, childhood psychology. It's just a, a phenomenological an analysis. Mm -hmm. That's how the story is, and that how where it changed into. And the story today to today seemed to me a, a resolving of some issues. Also, I cannot say exactly what these are. But the story of today also brings a reaction uh, up in me that a whole field of personality is left out. And so that's an intuitive feedback. We, would, we can use it in that way, but it's just an offer. Everybody can say that's a projection. Mm -hmm. Only if I adopt it, because it has meaning to me, it, it gets importance for me. I already mentioned it, that Vanita thought that if script work would have been developed by Byrne, he would have gone into that direction. I don't know whether this is Byrne or whether this is Vanita, but I like it. <laughs> so I look at these things from the position, life is meaning. Human are narrative beings. Life is myth, is telling your story. And people are always somehow oriented to what they want to become. If you listen with these ears, somebody's telling you something. After five minutes, you get an idea what the person is telling you what he is about to become and what his soul or his ego, whoever, wants to reach next in life development. And it's very important to get a sense of, uh, does it make sense to you, what this person is trying to achieve and to develop, or doesn't it make sense to you? And if you respond on the level of, I hear what you are heading for, and the person also thinking she hadn't said that, feels understood. That's important relationship building. 
And this kind of empathy, I guess, is much more important or as equal important as the empathy for what where the person is coming from, is what the person tends to go to. And if I have ideas the person immediately adopts, adopts or at least is inspired, what I see in the person, what the person could be, <clears throat> this is a, a important force in working together. So it's the relationship is inspired not by understanding from where we come, but from um, understanding where we try to go and how we could do that together. So it's intuition for the possible future and gives the person inspiration how this could look like. And, oh, I understand that you want to be important and when I look on at which stages you are thinking, I doubt whether this is possible on these stages. But I have other stages in mind that you could try. So the person feels accepted in their tendencies to develop and giving ideas how to rearrange life plans that the chance that they will be successful is just higher. And I think it's a it's a good service to uh, to to open your competence in understanding possible future ways uh, and uh, inspires the person with that. And this has very often nothing to do with the person is bringing into the relationship. It's something you bring into the relationship. And for me, that's okay. That's a creative service. So, I came to the method with the inner images when I was a student counselor. This was more than 30 years ago. And I had to do with students that somehow lost track, as if the strings of a puppet had been cut. And I have learned working <laughs> techniques and many things how students can learn how to be study successful. But with some of these people I had the feeling it's, it doesn't make sense to work like that. We have to restart from some kind of origin to understand uh, what this person is going to be in life and then find out whether the study can somehow be meaningful, be connected with that. Otherwise, it's totally understandable that this student is not interested to do study work. And this was, ah, now I know it must have been around 1977. I came back from the first GA conference and Bill Holloway did this guided imagery there. And, and I never before had a guided imagery and I loved it and I experimented with things like that. So I invited four or five students, mostly men, to a day and let, let's find out somehow where we can restart what could make meaning to you. And I and the question came to my mind, when you were young, what was your idea what you will be one day? And most of the men at that time spontaneously answered engine driver, train engine driver. And I was not sure whether this was a very good diagnostic question. <laughs> but then, uh, fortunately, I asked the second question. In case you were an engine driver, what is your life like as an engine driver? And the first one says, me and the engine. Nobody knows it as I do. And the other says, my colleague and I, two comrades, travel around the world. The third says, so many people who trust me, I shall guarantee for a safe trip. And the last one says, Oriental Express, many foreign countries, great uniform, I welcome all VIPs. This last one was a Romanistic student in its 20th uh, semester. And I said, do you enjoy your study? Mm. 
uh, but I enjoy my job. I say, what are you doing? Guess what? Mm-hmm. I'm in the entrance of a, of the Grand Hotel with Libre, and I greet the people coming in, and he loved it. Mm-hmm. And if you heard what ideas he had, how his life would be as an engine driver, total different occupation, you immediately understand a part of the mythology of this person. And you certainly, if you have so little information, you know that uh, the engine driver who says, my comrade and me, two guys traveling around the world, you cannot put this person alone on an engine. It's not their life they wanted uh, to have with being an engine driver. And the other one who says, my machine and me, nobody knows it as I do, you cannot um, transfer this person into the personal training department for engine drivers. He said, all all these machines, I'm not sure whether I know how they function. (laughs) So this was the early beginning. And and so very often uh, we could get an idea what what is the mythology of my life? What could, what, what did I dream? What my life could look like when uh, I have a profession? And then from that we check: could that be realistic? Is it possible to have these qualities uh, in a life by this profession? And then how do I have to study? How do I have to orient myself to use a professional development? to live a life that makes sense to my early dreams, my inner images, to my soul. And I know about something, I assume about something, about the wishes of my soul, the tendencies, by studying the inner images I have. I'm very uh, interested because that's exactly what I do in career development coaching. And I've done for, I was trying to think, is it since 77? Certainly since 18. Oh, wonderful. Something exactly the same. Yes. Work with the images, and then what is it in those images, which is a quality of... Right. ...that you want and is missing. Right, and you do, you extract from the images the co- meta-qualities, yeah. and then think how could maybe staying in your job by changing yeah. styles, these qualities be realized, or sometimes, uh, sometimes it's necessary to change roles, stages, yeah. or whatever. Yeah, yeah wonderful. Yeah. Very effective. Yeah. Very fast. Yeah. yeah. And pe- and people have no problems to tune into that. They they immediately understand what you're talking about with them. And my my experience is uh, these images are not hidden. Mm. It's only because nobody asks. Mm. Or they may ridicule them. Of, oh well, that was when I was a little kid, and that's silly. Yeah, so they need some. Nobody can be a they Simon. Need, they Simon need, is yeah, a they, popular they need some reframing that it's <laughs> it's important to listen to these images. Yeah. yeah. So this is, is my own overall understanding of these images. We have millions of uh, impressions in our life, and some of these we store, and I guess we store them because they are telling something about us. So if we could put them all together in a puzzle, look at this puzzle and have dialogues with us about this puzzle, I can understand something about what my soul is wanting to to live in this life. And for example, when I think I told you about Moses, this is one of the mythological figures I'm somehow dealing with since yet decades. In the beginning, it was the time Moses uh, wanted to lead his uh, people out of Egypt. I thought the Egypt suppresses poor people, and Moses only has to give them, uh, uh, say, them, we start now, and everybody is glad to leave Egypt. Hmm. Yeah. I tried this in TAE world and said, okay, OT, uh, isn't it? We have to go through the desert and there will be a new world of GA and I was convinced everybody will follow me. But mm-hmm. half in the desert I think. 
So I found it very interesting to get to to read the interpretations that uh, it was not the problem that only the problem that the Egypts didn't want to let Moses' people go. It's also because they had made their their compromise. It was slavery, but it worked quite well. And there was a mm-hmm. desert, and whether there was a country with milk and honey, nobody knows. Only Moses says. And they don't know as a Moses. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so better they stay in Egypt. So now I begin to understand why my uh, trying to be Moses in the first start didn't work. <laughs> and, so, and so it's going on. Uh, but my tendency to um, convince people by doing something there makes them astonished. Mm-hmm. This is part of my nature. And this is why another picture of mine is uh, being a uh, director of a circus to show what is uh, what I, what is possible, and to get astonishment, and that people are inspired by that. That's that makes me happy if that happens. <laughs> yeah. And so you don't have only one myth; you can have several. It's it's a mosaic of that. Or, for example, my lifestyle. It tells me something uh, that all of the discussion around Vietnam War, the only thing really struck me is one sentence in an article that's saying that Ho Chi Minh still is uh, sewing his jacket himself. Why the hell does this sentence uh, touch me? It has to do something with my soul that I'm touched by this sentence. And if you keep a diary, and whenever pictures like that come to your mind, they sometimes are far away, then they spontaneously come and write them down, and then you will have a, 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 a mosaic, and then you can think about, uh, you, you will get a portrait of your soul. And it's not difficult. It's only that you want to do it. Or a warning, or maybe a script, if you... From these many uh, movies I've seen, why did this one a scene in a movie, why have this been stored in me? There was uh, a man who wanted to have a claim land in, in Indians' country, and he asked the uh, Indian chief, can I have land? And he said, why not? As far as you can surround in one from sunrise to sunset, this is, will be yours. And he's running and digging to show that he has been here. And the sun is always, almost going down, and then he came to a lake. And he wanted this lake also. But it was risky whether he will be around this lake before sun sunset. And the last scene of that film, and this is what touches me and tells me something about dangers for me and script or warnings I, I listen to, is that uh, in the last second he, ma- he made it. And he fell exhausted on the floor and the chief said, this land is yours now. But he didn't stand up again. He was dead. So, and and it's important. Uh, these uh, images we have gathered tell a lot about our mythology, our script, but our, also our ambitions, our life plans, uh, metaphors who tell what we could be, what will satisfy our soul. And this is why it makes sense to work with these metaphors, and it's not difficult. Okay, this is just written down that it makes sense all to also to introduce these things into organizational life. And when you look at this engine example, if you under, uh, I, I give you one example from um, a coaching process. There was a head of of a, of a, a, a fabricatory line, and he was 
he was excellent. It was at one location, and he was the chief of everybody and was responsible for all the departments around. Then the company reorganized, and he was very competent. This what was why he was put up in a higher position, but he was only responsible for one section, but globally. And after half a year, his performance went down. He got an angry man. He will always have been friendly. And he didn't know what happened with him. And so she called me and said, are you ready to do coaching with this man? He has a problem. And I made this interview with the images. And all images uh, somehow uh, sets the stage. There is one person in the middle and there is a tribe or a group around and he is in the middle and responsible for these people, that's his home group. And he felt wonderful. And if there was no picture that gave a hint for his new way of life uh, could make any sense to him. And so he understood that the matching between his mythology and the task and the organization got lost not because of him, but because of the reorganization and the company. And so uh, that he went down with his performance uh, is not a personal issue, it's just a consequence of a mismatching caused by the company. And I said, this. I didn't see... Sometimes if it's mixed, you can say, okay, can we elicit pictures, images that help you to find into that new mythology, to feel somehow at home. But with him it was very clear that's not his, the landscape of his soul. Mm. And the only thing I, I could tell him, if, if it doesn't change, you have to change jobs and you find a, a new matching so that you can be again in the midst of, of a community locally. But in organizational development, nobody ever thinks about what this means to the matching of mythologies. At least I told him, you do not need coaching. That's not a coaching issue. And he was lucky because half a year later, the uh, organizational change was rechanged. <laughs> and he was happy again. <laughs> Um, when I do uh, image work concerning person and profession, uh, then I have I have developed an interview with several sources of images. One I already told you this: when you were young, what we have your ideas been, what you will be sometime. Second is. When you look back to in your family, people in profession, who is coming to, up to your mind? Which images uh, touch you? And then I have a method asking, imagine, uh, who is, yeah, this is my uncle. It's John, John the farmer. Uh, then I ask, uh, John the farmer, uh, is he somehow, does, you, you don't have to like it. But do you have the feeling that somehow this is an relevant image for you? Yes. Okay, let's imagine there is a biographical movie about John the farmer. And this movie is over the whole lifespan. And this movie is presented over there in a, a special a cinema. And there is one screenshot hanging outside. What is on this screenshot? And, for example, he's saying, uh, I said, John? John the farmer? Or what was, which name did I choose? Yeah. John is, uh, it's, it's evening. John is about 50. He's standing in the court of his farm, in his farmyard. And he is striking a horse. He is calm. The horse is, horse is calm. And he's expecting 
a neighbor who is also a farmer coming to him uh, and you can see in his face that he is ready for a satisfying exchange between friends. This gives you immediately an atmosphere what are fruits, essences of a professional life. And uh, then you can go on and say, okay, uh, a, a, a man and a woman pass the cinema, they look at this picture, they feel somehow touched and while uh, continuing their walk, they are saying, oh, this is an example for somebody in profession who, and then they find a, a model, some kind of abstraction of that. I've all written all that down with many hints how to, to lead the interviews. I don't know whether I have uh, an interview in English, but in German we have video on tapes, uh, on video tapes, on audio tapes. Um, it, it's I have a catalog of questions and what to be aware of that when when you do this work. So it's um, if you're interested in, um, I do not remember now whether I have it translated, but it could be done. And then the next the, the next level of sources of images I uh, regularly ask is uh, the milieu you are coming from. Whoever was in that milieu, a person in profession. What comes up to your mind? Very often it's a teacher, it's a priest, it's a grocer at the edge. And then I say, okay, let's say uh, Tom's a priest. And then I say, okay, let's imagine the life, the professional life of Tom the priest is finished and it's a biographical movie made out of it. And it's playing in the cinema, so it's very uh, repetitive, the, the pattern of the question. And one screenshot is hanging outside. What is on that screenshot? And when you guess it this way, at the end you have 10, 12 screenshots of uh, real life pictures of life causes, of people the person somehow is related to. And then you look at them, it's, it's more an associative uh, procedure. And others look at it with with you and, and say, study how you react to it, what you want, do not like, want not to have. As I say, for example, there was a guy who had an uncle, he didn't want to mention this image because he didn't like it. Uh, but I catched it and I said, okay, tell me, and this uncle was some a trader on the tr trading market, and he was loud, but uh, he was successful in selling. And this guy was a very decent guy, but he didn't have the power. And I, I, and the one who had the power was disliked in his family, so he didn't. Uh, and I believe that these images are reflections of powers of the soul. By not liking those images, he is cutting one of his roots and trying by training be a powerful man, at the same time not connecting uh, to a force within his soul represented by a picture like this. And so we work on how can you uh, reframe uh, how you like it or not like it, what would be a good way of being like that, that you could adopt. And sometimes there are no pictures, uh, or, or not, not enough pictures for qualities you need. Then you can find out whether you, a, a person can adopt new pictures from literature, from movies, and whether they can become important. So that they do not work on a superficial competence level, but on a soul level to get energy and qualities. I also work with figures of literature, which books to touch you, like Fanita did, what stories. Uh, and it's and this work can be done if somebody doesn't not know what his issue is. 
just feeling somehow district, out of the track. Mm -hmm. And it's a relief for the client if you say, let's just fly over your soul landscape with these questions and find out whether we can take snapshots that give you a sense of where you are and what the problem is. And so like it. And when you, when it's done fine in a way, then they react in their dreams. And two weeks later we can talk about the dream reactions. And it's, it's funny and creative how the dreams uh, pick up pictures and transform them into no, in new pictures. So it's a very creative way to work, but certainly you you not do not really know what you do. You can only intuitively control the process. So this is concerning. Uh, you remember the Wiesloch competence formula: role competence, context competence, and meaning. You must you must have somehow a possibility to live your miss in the way you work. This is a question in, prof uh, in, in professional supervision, me and my professional life. Uh, it's somehow different in the dimension me and organization. And the matching question is, does how I understand myself on this mythological level has this something to, and the developments, has this something to do with how I, I perceive the organization I'm working with or working in? And for that, I have also demanded, uh, developed uh, exercises. And one is a, a guided imagery along one schema, and this is what we can do now, if you want. Yeah? Mm -hmm. When I uh, do very fo much focus guided imageries, uh, I first explain what I will do. It's the same principle to work transparent, because if, if you uh, pick up what the uh, idea is of the play we do, and you do uh, internally, then you can, if you are interested, much better help not to, not to produce pictures that distract you, but you can help to produce pictures on an unconscious level, it's not the, not the conscious production of pictures you want to have because that's how you want to understand yourself. And it's very easy. Uh, first I will invite you to pick a reference organization because there are many options. Maybe it's a team you're working in or it's a team you're working with or it's a part of an organization or it's a whole organization. You have somehow to choose and then keep that relationship stable during the process. If you change uh, organizations, and the one question the one organization and the other question the other, that is, I'm not sure whether you will come to a, to a comparable set of pictures. And then I will invite you uh, to let yourself find a picture about your development professionally in the past, your professional life in the past. That's me to, in the past, and me in the present, and me in the future. So you have three pictures that somehow reflect your personal development as a, in professional life. And then I invite you to be aware of that organization and find a picture for that organization where it was, how it was, and then how it is today, and what your ideas where this organization will go. And then we have six pictures, and this is the basis for uh, intuitive thinking about does this match or not, is matching growing or diminishing, and to get we usually do it that way, and we can do it here the way. I have a guided imagery, I elicit these six pictures, and then I tell somebody else these six pictures, and now he I relate to them. And the other person uh, just uh, watches what kind of images and pictures 
come up in me when I hear the other person relate to his or her pictures. And just telling that, not <coughs> supervising, not criticizing, but just telling what's coming up in me when I hear you relating what came up in you. And so that uh, it's, it's a, not a complicated format that might elicit very important perspectives for understanding where the matching on the mythological level or the cultural level is. So, can we do that now? <laughs>